Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13, and the King James text today reads, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Hallelujah. Go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, for you ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Hallelujah. Matthew 25, 1 through 13. Let's go to the Lord once again in prayer. Master, Savior, King Jesus, we love you, Lord. We love the Word of God. We love the presence of God. We love the anointing and the power of the Holy Ghost that we feel in the house of the Lord as we sing the truths of the church. The songs of Zion, everybody will be happy over there. Master, in the name of Jesus, I loose the anointing of the Holy Ghost in the house of God today. Master, I loose today the power of the Holy Ghost. Let your word go forth like a hammer and break the rock in pieces. Every hardened heart, every patch of fallow ground that the word of God might fall upon today, let it fall like thunder that the ground would be broken and that a way might be made for the seed to be received. <coughs> Lord, that it might come to fruition and it might grow up and bear fruit unto righteousness for your name's sake. How I need the anointing of the Holy Ghost. How every man and woman of God today who would dare stand in the sacred desk, how we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost as this message will Make clear, Master, today, touch every heart. Oh God, help us to be receptive to that which the Spirit would say unto the church at this hour. For we ask it in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I'm just going to throw something in as a bonus this afternoon. You know, the Word of God said that when Jesus returns, He's going to return with the sound of the trump and with the voice of the archangel. Now, there are some who have perverted so badly the Word of God that they would try to tell you that when it says He'll return with the sound of the trump and with the voice of the archangel. They try to tell you this is evidence that, that Jesus is an archangel, that He is Michael the archangel, because it says He's returning with the voice of the archangel. But I just want to point out 
to you today. Usually when a monarch or when a king makes their entrance, even when the president of the United States makes an entrance before Congress or before the joint houses, there is one a sergeant at arms, there is someone who will make the declaration. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you know, the president of the United States, there is a declaration as to his coming. Well, I want to tell you today, I believe this passage tells us what the voice of the archangel is going to declare. Hallelujah. In verse number 6 it declares, And at midnight there was a cry made, Oh, hallelujah! Behold, the bridegroom cometh! Hallelujah! And I believe the archangel will stand at the edge of heaven and make the declaration for the saints. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Hallelujah to God. Woo, glory. My Lord, have mercy. Woo. We're going to know he's on the way. We're going to know he's on route. We're going to know that he is just a split second from making his Appearance. Hallelujah. Oh, praise the name, Lord. Well, now that I've preached, let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my message today. Amen. Prepare yourself. One of the key points in this parable that we've read this afternoon that often seems to be overlooked is the notion that the virgins were required, listen, to prepare themselves. This is not a parable which illustrates the notion that we must let God do this or we must let the Lord do that for us, but rather that we alone are responsible for being prepared for the bridegroom's return. Hallelujah. Our God, listen to me children, our God is not going to make us ready, but rather we must prepare ourselves. Now how we go about preparing ourselves and being prepared is the object of this parable. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I've heard this preached on so many times growing up as a kid, and, and, and the way I've heard it preached, there, there, there's, a, there's a, a little bit of truth in it, but honestly, they don't preach it plainly in the fullness of what God is trying to tell us. They sort of, kind of, sort of allude to it, but they don't really make it plain. My objective this afternoon is to make it plain for you. The ten virgins all had lamps, but some had oil with their lamps, while others did not. Now you notice I said some had oil with their lamps. The reason that I say this is, in ancient biblical times, a lamp was a very simple device. It was simply a little dish, generally made of clay or porcelain as it were, and a lot of times it was nothing more than a shallow bowl. That's really all it amounted to. As time progressed, Someone realized that if you pinched one end of it a little bit together, you could create a little bit of a scoop where you then could kind of pull the uh, wick through, you know, and that that helped uh, for the oil to burn not quite as quickly. A lot of people, uh, you may not know, I don't know if you're aware or not, but the oil that was burned in biblical times was olive oil. 
We use olive oil when we anoint the sick or when we're praying over a prayer cloth. We use olive oil. Olive oil is representative of the Holy Ghost. It represents God being applied to the scene. It's bringing God to the scene. It's a physical representation of God is now here. Well, some of the interesting things about olive oil is, olive oil is, listen to me, this is interesting, is one of the purest oils that you can possibly find. Listen to this. When olive oil burns, there is no odor. When olive oil burns, there is no smoke. There is no soot. Because it is so pure that 99 point something percent of it literally burns and is consumed by the flame. So there's nothing left to waft up into the air. There is no smoke. There is no uh, odor. There is no smell. Olive oil is so pure and it has such a high flash point that if you tilt your lamp or you drop your lamp, the oil will not ignite. So it's one of the safest, oh hallelujah, I want to tell you something about my Holy Ghost, hallelujah, the Holy Ghost is pure, there is no odor when the Holy Ghost is burning, there is no smoke when the Holy Ghost is burning, and the Holy Ghost will not accidentally burn you up, hallelujah, I want to tell you, there is something wonderful about God using olive oil to represent his spirit. Hallelujah. I told you before, God doesn't do anything by accident. <laughs> Not a thing in the world. Now a lamp was present with each of the ten virgins, but only five of them had oil with their lamp. Say, Pastor, what do you mean with their lamp? Rather than in their lamp. Well, because you generally would carry the oil in a little separate container and you would only pour the oil in as you needed it. Olive oil burns at a rate of about half an, uh, half an ounce of oil per hour. These little dishes would only hold a few ounces of oil. And generally the wick that before they started creating the little spout, uh, the wick would literally just float on top of the oil. And because the oil doesn't burn like kerosene or gasoline, then only the flame that was on the part of the wick would burn. Only that little portion would burn. The rest of the the wick would be down in the oil, and when, when the flame would hit that pool of oil, it would just stop burning at that level, okay? And it would burn the oil at about half an ounce per hour. Generally, the average lamp would burn for about four or five hours, and then it would go out. So you always had to have another little container that you kept oil in. So that when your lamp went out, you were prepared to add oil to it. Hello now. Oh, I want to tell you now. My God have mercy. Only five of the virgins had prepared themselves and made sure that they had plenty of oil on hand. Not only enough oil to burn through the night so that were they to awaken and need uh, to relieve themselves or do whatever they might need to do, they could see their way because you see a lot of times in ancient times they would leave one of these lamps burning. As I've said, they were safe. You didn't have to worry about it being tipped over or falling and starting a fire. So a lot of times when it would get dark at night, they would light the lamp and then they'd simply allow it to burn. Well, of course, generally, listen to this, generally in the average household, by about midnight, it would have gone out. So if it went out about midnight, 
Look at the time that the bridegroom showed up. And at about midnight, at about the midnight hour, there was a cry that said, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. So all of a sudden, all these brides wake up. All these virgins wake up. And of course, their lamps are all mostly out, I'm sure. So they have to relight them. The only problem is only five of them had brought additional oil. It's not to say the first five hadn't had enough oil to burn for that first four or five hours while they were sleeping. Oh my goodness. But they hadn't prepared themselves for beyond that. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Then all of a sudden, they're looking at the five brides who had the additional oil, pouring that oil into their vessel so they could trim their lamp and relight it. And they're saying, oh, well, give me some of your extra oil. Give me some of the extra oil you've got. You follow what I'm saying? They weren't asking to pour out from the lamp that they had already filled. No, they're saying, you've got a supply of oil. You've got oil on hand to keep your lamps trimmed and burning for hours and hours yet to come. So share with us some of your supply. And of course the five virgins who had brought oil with them said, No, because we don't know how long a journey we've got. We don't know how far we've got to go. We may need that further oil that we've set aside yet again. We may need it yet later tonight or tomorrow. Oh, my Lord, I want to tell you something today. The virgins all had lamps, but some had oil and others did not. The key to this parable is in understanding what the lamps and the oil represent. A lamp is the vessel and the oil is the source of light. A lamp, listen to me children, in and of itself does not provide light. I've got a light up here. It's got a bulb in it. It's used when you go camping. It operates by batteries. That lamp is worthless without batteries, and I tell the truth. Yeah. Other lamps are worthless without a, a bulb in it. You can have it plugged into the wall. If there's not a bulb in it, it is still worthless. Well, a lamp without oil in biblical times was useless. It could not provide light because the lamp in and of itself does not provide light light, but it provides instead a safe and efficient way for oil to burn and in burning provide light. What good then would there be in purchasing lamps for your home, but not also purchasing light bulbs to screw into those lamps? What good would it be? to have a lamp in biblical times and not have oil. Mm -hmm. Does the lamp provide light in and of itself? No. But a lamp does provide the means whereby light might be created. In Psalm 119, verse 105, as well as verse 130, the word of the Lord declares, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. The entrance of thy words, verse 130, the entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. So the word of God is likened unto a lamp that provides light. But a lamp in and of itself does not provide light. Oh my goodness, have mercy. You have to have oil as well to burn within that lamp. This is why we know the biblical principle of Scripture that truth does not exist in the presence of one ingredient alone, but rather truth requires two things. 
There are two different places in the Word of God where Jesus made a declaration concerning truth. In one place, he said, Thy Word is truth. In another place, he said, Thy Spirit is truth. Throughout the Word of God, the Spirit of God is likened unto, guess what? Oil. Hallelujah. So when you put the oil in the lamp, oh my God, have mercy. When you put the Word with the Spirit, you get light. Oh, hallelujah. The only way to get the illumination that you need is to have the Word and the Spirit. Oh my God, have mercy. There are churches by the millions in our world today like the five virgins who had lamps but had no oil. There are many churches, there are many preachers, there are many teachers in our world today who have the Word of God. They have the Bible, mm -hmm. but they don't have the Spirit of God. And they think they possess the means whereby they are able to attain truth. Wrong. You have to have both. The empty lamp is useless. The empty lamp is worthless. It will provide you with nothing except something more to carry. My Lord have mercy. <sighs> Now listen, in John chapter 3, verses 16 through 21, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him, in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So I got news for you, children. The name Jesus plays a role in your salvation. Mm -hmm. And this is the condemnation that light it's come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light. Because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light. Lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. Oh my goodness. Light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. What is the light? Truth. How is the truth attained? Using a lamp full of oil. Hallelujah. And the light that burns is what? Truth. Hallelujah. It's the light. Now listen to John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. All things were made by Him, and was not anything made that was made. Got news for you, children, that includes angels and demons. We're not just talking about heaven and plants and animals and humanity. No, no, all things were made by Him. That would include the angelic host. Now listen, in Him was life... And the life was the light of men. Oh my goodness. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light. 
that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Listen, even to them that believe on his name. The name Jesus plays an important role in your salvation. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Oh, my Lord, have mercy. And the Word became flesh. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. <laughs> Jesus said, I am the way, <laughs> the truth, and the life. Mm, truth, that's the fire. The word is the lamp. The spirit is the oil. Oh, my God, have mercy. <laughs> oh, I hope you did this. If this don't set you on fire, nothing will. The word of God declares... To wit, God, who is the Spirit, was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. God turned the Word into a human form, a flesh and blood body. That's the lamp. He then filled it with himself. Hallelujah. Which is the Spirit. And there's the oil. And from that we found truth. Hallelujah. He was the light of the world. Glory to God. He provided the light of truth. He provided illumination. He showed us the way. Glory to God because the lamp was full of oil hallelujah to God and he demonstrated for you and I today what a spirit filled believer can be oh my lord have mercy Whew. Wow! isn't that marvelous today in the book of revelation we are told that the glory of God is to be the light of in which the saints will live in God's new Jerusalem. In Revelation 21 verse 23, And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it. And the Lamb is the light thereof. Oh, hallelujah. What then is the glory of God? The Lamb. Hallelujah. That's why the Word of God said, one day every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then it adds the phrase, to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. When we acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, we acknowledge that He is the glory of God. Hallelujah. He is the source of God's glory. He is the personification of God's glory. Hallelujah to the Lamb. And it's that glory. It's the Lamb who's going to light all of the new Jerusalem for the people of God for eternity. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I love the Word of God, don't you? Mm -hmm. Amen. I love the Word of God. Oh, Jesus Christ is the Word of God incarnate. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, John wrote. So the Word of God 
was first spirit as God himself, his spirit. And that spirit then occupied flesh so that he might live among us. The word, the lamp, became flesh. The flesh was the lamp. The occupying spirit was the oil which provided the light which emanated from the lamp. That's why Jesus said, believe that I'm in the Father and I'm, I'm the Father in me. He said, or else believe me for my very work's sake. Hallelujah. Oh my goodness. He said, look at the light that I'm producing. Doesn't that tell you something? My Lord, have mercy. <laughs> You got to understand today the nature of the oil. The man Jesus Christ was that physical vessel occupied by the Spirit. Jesus is the Word. He's the Lamp. But it's the indwelling Spirit that burns with the fire of God. He was our example. Thus, He serves as our elder brother. This is why he's referred to as our elder brother or the firstborn among many brethren. Why? He did not come to demonstrate the Father. He was the Father, but his purpose in coming was not to demonstrate the Father. If he'd come to demonstrate the Father, he'd have walked around a thousand feet tall and, you know, had thunder and lightning and storms. And Okay, he didn't come to demonstrate the Father. But to demonstrate, listen, how we would become spirit-filled, anointed men and women of God through whom the Spirit of God would work. Oh my goodness. Thus we see the language found in Acts 10 verse 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. Whenever you see the word anointing or anointed, it is speaking of the practice of using oil to anoint, okay? How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. What with the Holy Ghost? So what is the oil of the Holy Ghost? And with power, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him him. You see, there's an important element. There's an important truth to understand. A lot of times we apostolics, you know, we focus so much on the deity of Christ that we wind up losing out in not understanding the importance of the humanity of Christ because he was both man and God simultaneously. He was flesh and blood as we are. Thus he was man. He was the only man ever to be occupied by the Spirit of God alone. See, the Holy Ghost come into me when I was a kid, but I've already got a spirit of my own. So now the Spirit of God occupies my life in unison with my spirit. Jesus did not have that. The only spirit in that body was God's. Hallelujah. That's why Paul the Apostle said, for without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. Manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. Justified meaning perfect, pure. Of course he was pure in spirit because olive oil is pure. Hallelujah. There is no purer oil than olive oil. There is literally no oil purer than olive oil. Oh my goodness. Luke chapter 4 verses 16 through 19. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Esaias. And when he had opened the book, 
he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me, there's that oil again, to preach the gospel to the poor, he hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Once again, we have that reference to the anointing. That's why the word Messiah and the word Christ speak of the anointed one. That's what it means, the anointed one. What does that mean? That means the one for whom God is present. Hallelujah. God is there in this person. This person is not alone. God is with this person. God is in this person. God is working through this person. Now in 1 John chapter 2, verses 27 and 28, listen to what John says to the church, to you and I. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you but as the same anointing, what does that mean? What do we talk about anointing? It implies presence, that same presence of what? The Spirit of God. That same presence of the Spirit of God, listen, teacheth you all things, of all things, and is truth, and is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. And now little children abide in him that when he shall appear, listen, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Huh. In the same passage he speaks of the anointing teaching us, preparing us. He says now little children you want to make sure you're ready when it comes. You don't want to be ashamed when it comes. You don't want to be one of them five virgins that have oil in their lamp. Oh, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of Christians running around. They got the lamp, but they're missing oil. There's a lot of churches in our world today, folks, that have the lamp. They're still using the Bible. They're still preaching from this sacred text. But they're lacking oil. Their message has gone off course. They are no longer preaching, thus saith the Lord. They are no longer preaching what God speaks to the messenger to preach. They're no longer preaching a word from the Lord. You see, every Sunday I get up and I ask God to anoint me. Every single Sunday I ask Him to anoint me when I preach. Why? I'll tell you why. Because I know that the message I'm about to preach is a word that God has given given me for the church at that hour. And all I'm asking God to do is to allow His presence to come down and use me so that I can be effective in communicating that message which He's given me for the church so that I can effectively communicate it to you. I can't do it by myself. I can't. Why can't I? Because the best I can do is share the Word. But the Spirit has to be part of the process. Because if the Holy Ghost isn't touching you as you're hearing me preach, if the Holy Ghost isn't illuminating and bringing light and understanding to what you're hearing, then these words are going to just fall in your ear and fall out. They're going to pop out as soon as you've heard them. You see, the Word and the Spirit are necessary in order for truth to be present. Oh, that gives whole new meaning also. To Jesus saying to the woman at the well, God is the Spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. 
Oh my goodness. Oh my good. Don't worship God based on the Word of God alone. You better have the Spirit present or else there will be no truth. Oh my word, have mercy. You can't have truth without the Word of God in union with the Spirit of God. Many believers in the church world today are happy to have in their possession the Word of God. However, they've decided it is not necessary that the anointing or the Spirit be present in their lives. There are pastors and churches today who are happy to have the Word of God, but they've decided that it is not necessary that the Spirit of God be present in their meetings. They attend anointingless churches. They listen, believers listen to anointingless preaching. They embrace teaching that allows them to believe in carnal ways, hateful, malicious, evil ways. They're not challenged as believers to step up and be the people of love and grace that the Word of God calls us to be. But rather they love teachers who tell them that they can be judgmental, critical, nasty, hateful, mean-spirited, argumentative. Oh my goodness. All these things that the Word of God strictly tells us not to be. But how can this be? They have the Word of God in their possession. Yeah. Yeah but not the Spirit. Mm -hmm. Scripture tells us the Word kills, but the Spirit maketh alive. Well, I'll tell you something. When you have the Word without the Spirit, not only do you have a lack of truth and thus a lack of light, illumination, but you have destruction. That's you right. have something that brings destruction. Yes. I'm going to tell you, I've, I've watched, my heart breaks for Leslie Jordan, the actor who recently passed away in a car wreck. It's, it's interesting because the week that he passed away, literally, 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 the week that he passed away, I had watched him on this new program he's doing, was doing on, on TV, and uh, Call Me Cat. I had watched him on this program, and I told Tommy, I, said, I don't know what on earth it is, but all of a sudden, something that week came over me, and I found myself flooded with this sense of compassion for this man, this sense of connection to this man, this burden for this man. It, it, this, it just came over me, and, and all week long I had this feeling on me, and then all of a sudden I read that he had died in a car wreck. And my heart broke. I began to look into some of his stuff online, and, and I didn't know this. I didn't realize he was born and raised Southern Baptist. I didn't realize that he had felt pushed out of the church and, uh, and put away by the church, and, you know, and that he had left his Christian faith and all this other, you know, but that in his heart he still loved to sing some of the old songs of Zion. He loved to sing some of the old songs of the church. They still brought him comfort. They still brought him peace, you know. And, and I began to look at all kinds of things online related to his life and uh, uh, many interviews he he did and everything. And let me tell you something. I saw the utter destruction that the Southern Baptist Church visited upon this poor soul. Mm -hmm. Now some of you don't get mad at me. Get mad at me all you want to. But that's what you get when you got the Word and not the Spirit. That's what you got. That's what you get when you have a lamp and you have no oil. Hallelujah. That's what you get when the Word of God is present to destroy, but the Spirit of God is not present to make alive. Oh, my word, have mercy. Well, I'll tell you something. There are a lot of Pentecostal churches. I remember as a young man, 
grown up. I'm going to go a little bit long today. I warn you right now, but I'll try to keep it as, as concise as I can. Growing up in the Pentecostal church, I can't even count how many times I stood up to testify and the anointing of the Holy Ghost would come upon me and I would begin, in essence, to prophesy and I begin to warn my church that I grew up in. You're allowing the anointing to fade. You are being satisfied with far less than the anointing of the Holy Ghost. You are much, uh, easy, you're much more easily satisfied today. You're not longing. You're not hungering for the power of God like you once did. And the Spirit of the Lord is fading. The oil is burning. Honey, you got to keep replenishing. It. You got to keep going to the market and buying some oil. You constantly have to keep a supply on hand. It doesn't just uh, stay there because it's there. No, it's there for a purpose to provide light in your lamp. It has to burn. So you must have oil always on supply to keep pouring and to keep pouring. Oh, today, what am I trying to tell the church in this message? I'm trying to tell you today, church, you better be careful about what church you attend. I'm here to tell you today, you better be careful about what pastor you listen to or what preacher on TV you believe. I'm here to tell you today, you better be mindful of the message that you're listening to because Honey, if you're not in a place where you can get you some oil, hallelujah, and take it home with you so that you can always constantly forever have a supply of the anointing of the Holy Ghost, then you're in trouble. And many believers today are going to churches that don't have any oil. And many people today are listening to preachers who don't provide any oil. And there is no and they will be found wanting. And the point of this message today is, the point of our primary text today is, it's up to you to get the oil. It's not up to God. Don't sit there and say, Oh Lord, just pour all out upon me, Jesus. Oh Lord, just let the oil flow. See, that's what I grew up hearing. That the oil represented the infilling of the Holy Ghost. But no, it's not what it represents. It, it does, but it doesn't. Let's put it that way. It represents far more than that. It represents oil that burns. You see, the Holy Ghost infilling, according to the Word of God, once you get the Holy Ghost, you've got the Holy Ghost. It'll never leave you. It'll never forsake you. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, the Holy Ghost will never forsake us. So once you've got the Holy Ghost, that gift is yours. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. You'll have the Holy Ghost if you backslide and go into a bar room. Honey, you're bringing the Holy Ghost with you. If you backslide and bring the Holy Ghost into a brothel you're bringing the Holy Ghost with you into that brothel if you backslide and go into a drug den or a crack house honey got news for you you're bringing the Holy Ghost with you into that crack house or into that drug den because God does not leave the believer the Spirit of God does not believe, leave the believer there is no expiration date on the Spirit of God in the life of a believer but the anointing is something different. You have to keep going back. Hallelujah. You have to keep going back. You have to keep dipping. That's why the Word of God said, Now faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's why the Word of God said, Forsaking not the assembling of yourselves together, as is the custom of some. Listen, but even the more, even the more, even the more, as you see the day approaching. Why? Because you need to have oil, honey. You need to have a supply of the anointing. You need to have a supply of oil so you can burn your lamp when the bridegroom comes. Too many believers are satisfied to go to dead churches. Too many believers. Tommy and I have gone to conferences. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. 
We've gone to conferences where preacher after preacher got up and talked about, oh, we've had such a wonderful move of God this week. Oh, we've had such a wonderful anointing of the Holy Ghost this week. And I look at Tommy and say, what meeting they've been had? It ain't the same one I've been at. Oh, Pastor, you're just overcritical. That's what they said about me, Tommy, when I was an 8-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old prophesying in the church I grew up in. I just being overcritical. I just being too hard. Oh, he just, he just, you know, he just is being hard. No, I wasn't. I was warning, and there were times I would go into tears and beg the people of God. Oh, you've got to, you've got to get back to desiring the anointing and the presence and the power of God that this church once knew. We've got to get back there, folks, because we're losing it. It's going away. It's fading. The oil is burning, and we have none on hand to refill the lamp. Go to that church I grew up in today. Deadest, driest, most spiritless pile of crap you ever want to visit in your life. It'll give you a good run if you want to compare it to First Baptist or First Methodist or First Presbyterian. And it's supposed to be a Pentecostal church. I remember a time when the Holy Ghost would fall in that church and members one after another after another after another throughout the congregation would be slain under the power of the Holy Ghost would be slain in the Spirit and honey, they'd be out for hours. None of this Benny Hinn dog and pony show crap. Oh, you fall down, you stand up, you fall down. Like God has nothing better to do than to knock you over to play games. Baloney. That's dog and pony show. It's fake, it's fraudulent, it's counterfeit, it's garbage. If you think you're going to go home from one of those meetings with oil to use to keep your lamp trimmed and burning, honey, got news for you, you're not. I remember meetings and growing up as a kid where the power of God fell. We, got, we started church at 7 o'clock on Sunday night and we didn't finish till 2 o'clock that morning. And even then, we went home so high and so drunk on the Holy Ghost that the whole week long we felt like we could walk on water and just float in the air. Literally. Go there now. They wouldn't know what if, if a meeting like that happened, it would scare them out of their minds. They don't even know what it is anymore. See, they kept electing pastor after pastor. and the, Well, actually, they got to the point where they elected one pastor in particular who had no calling on his life, who had no anointing. I stood up and I warned them. I prophesied, you don't want to elect this man. You do not want to bring the... This is not the right man. This is not the man for this church. Oh, but the church secretary, the lady in our church who had been our secretary for many years, oh, he graduated from my alma mater. He graduated from the Bible college I went to. Oh, I want to give him his first pastorate. I want to give him a chance. Oh, no, 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 honey. You don't want to give somebody their first pastorate. You don't want to give somebody their first chance. That is not the criteria for electing a pastor. You want somebody who can keep you in the vein. You want somebody who can keep you under the spout where the glory comes out. You want somebody who has an anointing on their life. who manifests the power and the presence of God in his or her preaching and teaching. Oh, my Lord. I want to tell you today, I'm trying to finish, the Word of God predicts an age of oilless anointingless believers. In Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 14, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. 
but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, meaning it's the enemy of God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if, if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, ye are debtors, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. So that's what God wants from us right there. Now, let's see what the Word of God says is going to happen. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7. This know also that in the last days, perilous, meaning life-threatening, times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, meaning vain or conceited, covetous, meaning wanting what others have, boasters, meaning braggarts or self-ingratiating, proud, blasphemers, meaning speaking as truth, that which contradicts the truth. Disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. What is unholy? Not reflecting the nature of our God. Verse 3, without natural affection, parents that don't love their children, children who don't love their parents, and so on. Truce breakers. What is a truce breaker? One who makes agreements to secure peace, only then to reignite violence or war by acting against one's own agreed terms. False accusers. Incontinent. What does that mean? Without self-control. Fierce, meaning wild or unbridled, viciously mean despisers of those that are good. Traitors, what does that mean? Turning on friends and associates. Heedy, meaning what? Stubborn, self-willed. High-minded, meaning thinking themselves better than others. Pretentious, hypocritical. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness meaning they're religious in appearance, but denying the power thereof, meaning that they appear religious, but they're not at all godly in their conduct. Then Paul says, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. <sighs> Second Timothy 4, 1 through 5, and this is my final passage for today. Paul writes to Timothy again, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead, at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all 
long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. How do you achieve truth? The lamp filled with oil set on fire. Hallelujah. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. I've been 30 years trying to do an affirming ministry. <clears throat> In 30 years, I've had little bright spots like I was talking about earlier where we had some wonderful services and God really moved. But you know what? People just have not wanted to commit themselves to this church. They've not wanted to commit themselves. And I mean, you, if you're going to do something for the Lord, you've got to be sold out. And you've got to hold out. You can't afford to play games. You can't afford to be in today and out tomorrow and all this foolishness. There have been a few bright spots. And I don't want to take away from the bright spots. But I'm going to tell you something. For 30 years, I have not had... A church. Period. That's the end of my statement. I told. I just said this to Tommy last night. I was watching some videos on YouTube, some church services, some meetings where the Spirit of the Lord was really present and people were worshiping God with sincerity and worshiping God in the Spirit and worshiping God uh, the way that He ought to be worshipped. And I go into bitter tears, don't I, Booby? Mm -hmm. Yes. I go into bitter tears. Sometimes I sob. I can be alone at the house. Tommy can be with me. And sometimes I literally just begin to sob because I miss that so much. I know what the anointing looks like. I know what it looks like when God is present and when the power of God and the presence of God is real in the midst of His people. I know what that looks like. I've said a thousand times from this pulpit that I'm headed there. That's the direction this ministry is headed in. Why? How do I know? Because I won't be satisfied with anything less. I'll never, ever be satisfied with anything less. I'll never be one of those foolish preachers who gets up at a conference and says, oh, we've had such a wonderful anointing. Oh, the power of God's been so wonderful. When in reality, there was nothing there. No, I'm going to keep pressing. I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to keep preaching till I get a church full of people who know how to worship God, who know how to pray, who know how to live for the Lord sincerely, who know how to live for the Lord with passion, until we experience the move and the power and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, as I know God can move and as God can do. I know because I've, I've pastored churches, I've been part of churches, I've seen it my whole life. Honey, I cannot be satisfied in an anointingless church. I can't be satisfied with anointingless preaching. There's a reason this preacher preaches what I preach the way I preach it. A lot of people would, oh, I'd probably come to your church if you didn't preach and spit and sputter and yell and holler. I'm sorry. But when the power of God is on you, it's like Jeremiah said, it's like fire shut up in my bones. I can't just get up and talk about it like Joel Osteen does. I'm sorry! It's real to me! It's called the anointing! And I'll be hanged 
if I'm going to try to shut myself down and quiet myself down and calm myself down to appeal to people. No, 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 no. Because then our church will have no more oil for you to bring home than the church down the road does. That's right. I want to be where the oil flows. I want to be able to keep my lamp trimmed and burning. I want to keep my supply full. And the only way one can do this is to be in a place where the oil is in constant supply. The Spirit of God will not only help you to understand the Word of God, but His indwelling Spirit will help you to live the Word of God. Every time we enter the presence of God and receive from the Word of God quickened or made alive by the anointing of the Holy Ghost, we are encouraged, challenged, empowered to live as God would have us to live and to do as God would have us to do. But if we allow ourselves to be drawn to those men and women, those churches, those denominations, those organizations where the oil and anointing of the Holy Ghost is not present, we will be encouraged in our carnality and given permission to walk in our own ungodly ways. We cannot afford to do this. God is not responsible for our seeking out and purchasing oil for our lamps. We are. It is our responsibility today to prepare ourselves. The Lord will not do it for us. We must be guardians of our lamps and we must make certain that we are always in a place where we might keep our lamps full and our oil supply present. Hallelujah yes, to God. Lord. The Word of God without the Spirit is a lamp devoid of oil. Prepare yourself. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this afternoon?